Hello and welcome. My name is Zafar Iqbal and you're watching The Mojo Story. At a time when Omicron cases are being reported in India, there is no final recommendation that's been given to the health ministry by the National Technical Advisory Group of Immunization about the requirement for additional doses of vaccines to immunocompromise people and on the issue of child immunization. Now, Omicron cases uh, were first detected in Africa in late November. Uh, the Omicron vi variant has been reported in 57 nations so far. It's likely to spread internationally and poses a, a health risk, a high health risk of uh, infection. Uh, now, we will, of course, discuss this issue uh, with our panel. We are uh, joined by an eminent panel to discuss this uh, issue. Uh, now, the recommendations have not gone to the health ministry, even as the Indian Medical Inst uh, Association has reportedly uh, said that the government must expedite the proposal for vaccination of children of 12 to 18 years at the earliest. Uh, we joined by an eminent panel. We joined uh, by Dr. Uh, Dr. Bakul Parikh, who's a senior pediatrician. We are also joined by Dr. Chandrakant Lahariya, uh, epidemiologist, and Dr. Trupti Gilara, infectious disease expert. Uh, if I may start with you, Dr. Trupti, uh, we've seen the cases of Omicron uh, being reported in India. How serious is the threat as of now? Yeah, can you hear me, uh, Dr. Tripti? Okay, it seems that uh, that we have some problem in the connection. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Uh, Bakul Parikh. Uh, uh, Dr. Sub, if you can hear me, uh, the cases are being reported in India now. How serious is the threat as of now? Yeah, I can uh, say straight away that it's not a real serious threat as per the studies available. Though Omicron is very react, uh, infective with RO of 9, it can infect a large population very fast, but the disease which it causes is very mild. Nobody has required much of hospitalization or ICU care, as has been reported from South Africa and the places where this has been seen in a very large number. So I suppose that Omicron may be a variant with lots of infectivity, but with less virulence. So we should not panic. So this uh, it is a worry, but of course now there's a lot of experience that has been gained uh, over the past months dealing with COVID. Uh, but according uh, to some reports, uh, uh, they say that a third dose of vaccine actually neutralizes uh, Omicron. And there are reports that suggest that booster dose with current version of vaccine increases uh, antibodies by 25-fold. Uh, what do you have to say about that? So basically, uh, the studies have shown that booster definitely leads to a robust immune response. If you have taken two doses and your uh, antibodies are already there, of course, you know that humoral uh, antibodies will wane over a period of time. But T-cell immunity is always there for the memory. So whenever there is any infection again or any vaccine dose which is taken again, there will be a robust response to this particular variant and yeah. uh, the immunity increases by 25 fold so it's a very good concept and i suppose in a very short time the booster dose will be started by the government yes of course uh, that's the hope but uh, uh, but uh, there's also this uh, people uh, you know this the people need to understand that what's the difference between an additional dose and a booster dose additional dose for immunocompromised people to boost uh, you know to provide additional protection and also uh, the booster dose uh, uh, what's the what's the difference between the two yeah so here uh, any immunocompromised host the immune response is always going to be low or uh, very mild as compared to the immunocompetent person so they require additional antigen stimulation for the antibodies to develop. So that's why they yeah. require a third dose in line with the first and second dose at a particular interval. But the booster yeah. dose is one 
where you have taken two doses and six months or nine months have passed and then you take a particular dose as a booster dose to uh, yeah. boost up your immunity and help you in fighting this variant so there's the yeah. difference between the third dose as an additional dose for the immunocompromised people and yeah. the vex a booster dose which is taken after 6 to 9 months of the second dose which is taken as a dose for increasing your boosting up your immunity yes uh, uh, dr chandrakant uh, laharia do you think that uh, that is time for giving booster dose to the immunocompromised people uh, you know given the cases of uh, omicron that are being reported in india thank you so what we need to remember that uh, the purpose of ongoing covid-19 vaccination is to prevent from severe disease hospitalization and death and giving two primary shot of covid-19 vaccines from, from prevent from these outcomes therefore it is very important that to be administer the first shot and second shot of the existing covid-19 vaccine to as many people as possible and especially we ensure that these two shots are reached to the those people who are at higher risk of severe disease hospitalization and death now in this context we know that uh, though omicron has been reported from different parts of the world it does not cause that kind of severe disease hospitalization and death at least yeah. as of now so there is no benefit with the current knowledge to say that giving booster dose will provide additional protection and rather it might have a detrimental effect that uh, the in, the limited vaccine might be diverted to booster and the attention might be diverted from the what should be the core focus so uh, there is at least as of now there is no need of giving booster dose it might be required in the future but i also want to bring another dimension and that dimension yeah. is that in the covid 19 the available vaccines are on different platforms each of the vaccine work very differently what we know and what global evidence is available some from some research research that uh, the pfizer biontech vaccine if we give third dose it increase the quantity of antibody but that kind of evidence is not available for vaccines being used in india neither covishield vaccine nor covaxin vaccine so we really do not know what would happen if we give a third shot so first requirement is that the additional evidence is generated we increase the coverage with the first and second shot and then once we have evidence the decision on booster dose can be taken but right now it's not recommended that's what the evidence is Yes, we are. We are again joined by Dr. Tripti Gulada. Um, uh, Doctor, uh, Dr. Tripti Gulada, if you can hear me now, uh, I think the line is okay now. Uh, we're talking about the booster dose. Uh, the priority right now for the government is, of course, to vaccinate the eligible population rather than go for the booster dose. Uh, we were talking that what 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 should be done. Uh, right now given that we've seen reports of co- uh, omicron cases coming from different parts of india so so i completely agree with dr lehria that what is important is to give the first two doses to the maximum population uh, but what is also important to remember is that there is a certain group of population what we call as uh, immunocompromised or those who might not mount the right amount of immunity with two doses Uh, yeah. and there are studies that have shown that this specific population might require an additional dose of the vaccine which actually is not called as a booster dose it's just that a third dose is required yeah. and i think uh, for our setup we really need to study which of this population do we need to prioritize to receive that third dose not at a gap of 6 months because the third dose in these individuals yeah. comes at an early age Uh, mm-hmm. because when we all talk about booster dose we say that the booster dose will be given to the ones who are at highest risk of severe infection which is the immunocompromised patients uh, so this population should probably be given their third dose and that is something that will have to be studied and a policy decision have to be taken and in the meanwhile obviously we ramp up our vaccination encourage people you know the silver lining to this entire omicron fear has been that people who were hesitant to take a vaccine for all these months are now coming forward to at least take their first and the second shot so uh, while the data on omicron becomes more clear and hopefully it will not be that severe we should use this as an opportunity to encourage people to take their first and second shots yes of course uh, uh, that's uh, that's the focus uh, of the government right now it seems uh, but but vaccination of children we we're, we're also uh, discussing that uh, topic is do you think that there is a lack of consensus uh, as of now for starting the vaccination in children 
Yeah, Dr. Tripti. Uh, so we we did see that um, our first vaccine for children, Zycob B, got approved in August, and then there were yes. some recommendations made by the SEC for the co-vaccine in children in October. But uh, neither Zycob B nor the co-vaccine co is available for children. Now there are two or three issues in kids' vaccination. Um, we know that the infection in children is not as severe. In fact, children are more likely to have an asymptomatic disease. But there is a certain subset of children that are at higher risk of symptomatic infection and at a higher risk of hospitalization. And these are kids with asthma or asthma-like illness. Uh, so even when the COVID vaccine becomes available, obviously, children's va children vaccine will have to become available. But with clear data on safety, because the last thing that we want to do is cause any side effects, especially when we know that kids do not have a severe COVID infection. So there has to be a very strong case of vaccinating kids. And both these vaccines have not undergone very large trials. Uh, so that data will also have to be made public because... One, approving the vaccine and then not making it available for the next three months also increases the vaccine hesitancy. Uh, the public starts wondering if the vaccine is approved, there must be something wrong with the vaccine that it's not made available. So whenever such approvals go through, it will be actually great for the entire vaccination program is that there's a plan in uh, like a solid plan of when is the vaccine going to be actually executed. And whenever Dr. it's executed, Larry. we know. Yeah, Dr. Laharia, if I can ask the same question to you, lack of uh, consensus uh, so far as vaccination of children is concerned. What we know that uh, there has always been a priority list of COVID-19 vaccination. And in that yeah. priority list, children have always been at the lower level of priority. It has been clear that the healthcare worker and frontline workers, then elderly, then 45 to 59 with comorbidity, then adult should get the COVID-19 vaccine for the region because this is the age group which develop more severe disease, more hospitalization. What we yeah. know, this data has been validated, emerged over the period of many months that children do not develop severe disease. They get infection at mm. a nearly similar rate and they do not develop severe disease hospitalization. That's what vaccine mm. prevents. So the benefit of vaccinating children is far lower. It's not zero, but the benefit is far lower. We also know the risk of the vaccination is not zero. Risk is, there is some risk with the vaccination and the risk is usually higher in children. So these are the two things from the technical perspective. But we also need to remember that uh, India till now had a, uh, less supply than demand. Now we have self-sufficiency, but there is yeah. no vaccine in India which is available for use in the children. So what should be done once the vaccines for children are available? The first priority should be given, as Dr. Tripti said, to the, those children who are at higher risk of disease. So that's the right order of priority. And the same challenge would arise if we start uh, vaccinating children. One, that is not required, or the benefit of vaccination less, risk is relatively higher. The mainstream vaccine for Indian COVID-19 vaccination program, Shield, is not licensed for uh, younger than 7, 18 years. So there are many other things. Once the Jicob D becomes available in market, I believe it will be prioritized as and when the decision is taken for children in the high risk age group. So there is no worry. And alongside the final points are we need to remember two things. Many of the parents think that uh, the children need to be vaccinated before they can go to school. That is not the correct thinking. Globally, many organizations, including UNICEF and other agencies, have said that the vaccination of children is not a prerequisite. Moreover, we know schools have been open and the children can go to school. So, they, so they, their turn would come most likely if there is a particular vaccine, for example, nasal vaccine, which can reduce the transmission of disease also. That would be the right vaccine. So it will be worth waiting to vaccinate children and uh, that will there will be time for their vaccination. The time is not now. And who will determine which children are first eligible for uh, the vaccine? Obviously, well, uh, the time is not uh, right now, as you said, but when the time comes, who will determine which children are first eligible for vaccine? So the right approach to determine which, uh, which children should be first eligible for vaccine is looking at the available COVID-19 data in India. And then it will provide a really good answer that which are the children, which are the disease condition, which are the age group, which are getting serious disease required hospitalization. So if Indian government, I'm sure they would be doing, but if Indian government start looking at the data on the hospitalization, severity of disease, mortality in children, that will provide an answer on which children should be prioritized. Those children should be prioritized. That's one. 
Second, from the global level, we know that children with pre-existing conditions, such as either they are obese or have a pre-existing condition of diabetes, uh, hypertension, or on the long-term yeah. treatment. And more, very recently, one of the Indian study has come up which say that children with asthma or asthma in Hindi, they are at mm. higher risk of disease. So these are the children who could be prioritized. However, that decision would be taken by what we call National Technical mm. Advisory Group on Immunization based upon yeah. all the evidence and they would determine that which children should be prioritized. And final point here is that it is not necessary that all children who are at higher risk in 12 to 17 need to be prioritized. Maybe in the beginning, it could be 16 to 17 year old children with the higher disease. Once that age group is covered, then age is uh, staggered manner 15 to 15, 16 or then 12 to 14. So it could be age staggered in a high risk population determined by Antagi based upon data. Well, uh, we're talking about children. I have some details. Uh, the, the WHO Office for Europe has reportedly said that children in the 5 to 14 age group now account for the highest COVID cases in the region. And there are reports from South Africa which indicate a sharp rise in hospital admissions in COVID positive children above the age of two. So, of course, uh, that's also uh, those things will also be looked at uh, very uh, keenly by uh, the authorities. Uh, but uh, but coming to a different point, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Parikh, if you can hear me, uh, there is a mismatch in the serum. In the Serum Institute is looking at slashing monthly production of vaccines by at least 50 percent. Uh, the Serum Institute has written to the government to see clarity uh, on its requirement. That news has also come in. Uh, we're still seeing that vaccinations are taking place all across the country, but but now uh, the government orders uh, have. Uh, calm down. What do you have to say about that? No, it is very unfortunate because vaccine supply will have to be very. Yeah, if you can unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear. You. Yeah. So it's an unfortunate uh, decision by Serum Institute, but production should continue. Their dilemma yeah. is that if there is no demand, why they should produce and waste the money as well yeah. as vaccine. But at the same yeah. time, government needs continuous supply because as Dr. Laria yeah. said, that second dose and boost. Yes. Can you hear Dr. Pari? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so that uh, production should have continued rather than slashing the production because supply is going to be needed because many people are still remaining to take the second dose. And uh... yes, so production should not stop just because uh, the the orders are not coming in. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Tripti Gilada, what's what are your views on this point? Uh, so vaccines have a certain shelf life. And yeah. if the vaccine production companies are not assured of these vaccines to be taken up, they are going to slow down the production based on the projections that they've made with the previous few weeks or the months of uh, the supply that they've provided. So given that Serum Institute does have a capacity of producing vaccines way faster than the speed of the current vaccination, it might actually be time to start thinking forward and making a strategy of what is a population that requires a third dose? When is it that it, India can go in for a booster? And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, even Covishield is undergoing uh, clinical trials for children. Yeah. So we do expect that by 2022, we will have results for that. So, uh, you know, all these things will have to be taken. Things will have to work in tandem because uh, yeah. if the demand is going to be low, then obviously they are going to slow down their production. Yes, and uh, I also wanted to understand uh, when we talk specifically again about children, I want to come back to that point. Uh, the final recommendation has not so far been made to the health ministry by the National Technical Advisory uh, Group on Immunization as far as the vaccine for children is concerned. But at the same time, uh, Indian Medical Institute Association has said that government should expedite the proposal for vaccination of children of 12 to 18 years at the earliest. So isn't there some sort of a contradiction here? Yeah, Dr. Lahiriya? Well, so the Indian Medical Association has said that the vaccination of children should be expedited. And I'm not yeah. sure which kind of data they have used. 
what yeah. has been done by the government is uh, prioritized on a various grounds and that's a kind of global priority most of the countries have moved to the vaccination of children only after a certain level of uh, vaccination coverage achieved in the adult population second part is that uh, many of the cases which we uh, many of the reports which we are hearing that children should be vaccinated are in the context of omicron emergence but what we need to remember that uh, with the current available knowledge not much has changed for vaccination strategy in any part of the world or at least not for india in uh, that uh, any specific group should be vac vaccinated or a booster shot should be started that should be an independent decision uh, taken based upon various available data not influenced by omicron that's uh, one aspect but i also want to go back to the another dimension which you asked which was related to Uh, the new with that serum institute of india i decided yes. to reduce the production yes. the key is yes. i'm little surprised by that announcement the reason is that serum institute of india is a is a globally known vaccine manufacturer the covid shield is approved by who as part of emergency use listing so it has a far bigger market than indian market and then yes. there are many countries which are waiting for the vaccines to be available so mm. I'm, i'm not sure why it is not targeting other countries and there are other are dimension that yes. indian government and serum institute of india has a commitment to covax so i am fairly confident that there is a far bigger market beyond india for serum institute of india and any amount of vaccine which will be produced by india by any manufacturer there would be many takers at the global level so and then the final argument is that many people are saying that india should start vaccination of children because there is surplus supply or 50% of adults have received uh, both shot in my opinion the Supply, surplus supply or a specific uh, population coverage are not the criteria to open vaccination for any age group the criteria to open vaccination or start booster has to be scientific which are fairly well laid down by international agencies including world yeah. health organization yes but uh, as dr tripti was saying that there is a shelf life for vaccine so perhaps that's the reason that serum institute has come up with that statement well shelf life uh, is definitely a criteria but there is a far more global demand for vaccine and need that uh, and the serum institute of india as i said earlier is a who pre qualified uh, emergency use listed vaccine so there would be many countries and it has a commitment to covax so i am not sure i'm not privy to the kind of information on which yeah. it is saying but of course the demand in india might be going down but it could be a good news for rest of the world and the vaccine could be available for rest of the countries which are eagerly waiting for vaccination well uh, lastly uh, dr tripti and i'll ask each one of you are we in a better position to deal with any possible third wave if it hits the country we have seen those visuals in the second wave uh, the the devastation and you know the chaos that was all over uh, it's it's not so Uh, so harsh a situation right now the the new variant but god forbid if such a situation erupts are we in a better position to deal with that dr tripti first to you so if we were to compare us our, our situation today you know compared to the, between second and the fear third wave and what we were between the first and second wave uh, yes we we believe that we are in a better position uh, for several reasons one uh, a, a lot of our population is immune either because of the vaccination or for the large number of infections that took place in the second wave so the sero prevalence with covid antibodies in a lot of states and cities is you know between 70 to 90% and uh, with the understanding that these antibodies will protect us from the future infection uh, in that sense our population is less susceptible to infection and to severe infection and uh, in in terms of healthcare infrastructure we definitely think we have ramped up our infrastructure after the second wave but we shouldn't uh, take this too lightly because as soon as we take it lightly covid appropriate yeah. behavior goes low the vaccination drive slows down yeah. so while we are in this lull i think we need to make the best of use of this lull so that we actually avert the third wave yes and dr parikh uh, what do you say have lessons been learned Can you hear me, Dr. Pari? Okay, I'll ask uh, Dr. Lahiria. Uh, what do you say? Uh, have we learned all our lessons, and now we are in a better position to deal with any possible crisis that can uh, erupt in the future? 
so we are in better position to respond to any future or subsequent wave because of multitude of reasons one that the susceptible pool of population which was far greater before second wave is much smaller so even if there is a immune escape uh, due to uh, in the new variant the likely number of uh, severe disease and hospitalization will be very really small so all the estimates say that india is unlikely to see the kind of second wave it had witnessed in the past any future rise in cases would be far smaller 100000 in the worst case scenario rather in fact it would be even less and considering around 85% of adult population has received at least one shot of covid-19 vaccine which yeah. will which give some assurance that uh, the number of hospitalization will be less so in terms of infection and hospitalization the any future wave subsequent wave no matter which variant emerge would be far smaller and we are in better position and this is because of natural process not because our healthcare infrastructure is drastically changed yeah. yes there are few things which are really improved good that our health workers have personal protective equipment and other things for hospital supply the testing services is much better there is a genomic surveillance and hospital services are equipped so we can be confident that uh, the wave would be smaller the impact would be less but we need to remember that there is still a long way to go if people do not get vaccinated then they would continue to be risk at the risk of disease and there could be smaller pocket where there could be higher burden so uh this smaller impact would be less does not mean that we people should not get getting vaccinated who are due for their vaccination or people to stop following covid appropriate behavior this is till world is in the mid of pandemic till till new variant emerge in any part of the world it's important that we keep following those uh, process that is the assumption if we stop doing those process we really cannot predict what would happen so uh, all of this we are talking in context of some certain caveats and conditions last word to you uh, dr tripti uh, what's the progress on vaccination uh, up till now we sorry so we have seen the entire immunization science just uh, revolutionized during covid-19 and uh, the speed of production and the execution of vaccination has been phenomenal uh, we do hope that the vaccines in pipeline get approved quickly uh, we do hope that uh, we are able to tweak the vaccines based on newer variants and we are able to vaccinate majority of the susceptible population who is susceptible to severe illnesses whether it's the adults or the children in the next few months but i think we need to keep our guards on yes we have to keep our guard up that's the that's the moral of the story we cannot afford to be complacent uh, you know even if the third wave is not that intense but we have to keep up our guard that's all we have for today's show thanks to our panel for joining us and thanks to all of you thank you so much it's great to see you here thank you for watching our work if you haven't subscribed yet don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to mojo story and support independent robust journalism